Well, here we are. Welcome, 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 everyone. Finish Chish Hawa so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is a beautiful evening. I'm uh, I'm zooming in from um, Zintakihini, uh, Juneau, Alaska, on this beautiful uh, December sixth, uh, twenty twenty one, and I'm so happy to be able to be here with Shilugantanichkak and um, invite all of you to pull up some snacks and a coffee or tea and join us as we have a good conversation tonight with two very special guests. Uh, we're here for our Anxa You coffee time series and uh, we're gonna get into it pretty quickly here, but first we wanted to take a moment to welcome you all and thank you for joining us. Please share um, through your social media as well. This is going to be a really interesting conversation and we we encourage everyone to go ahead and do that so we have more folks able to access this discussion. Um, my name is Lagunai, uh, Liz Medicine Crow. I am Haida and Thinget. I come from Kihkwan, uh, Cake, Alaska, in um, the heart of Southeast. And I work for First Alaskans Institute with um, my sister here, Shilugan Tanichkak, and I'll hand it to her to introduce herself. Yeah, Chamai, everybody. We Shilukanatanichkak up to Hutna Melissa Martin. I am so privileged to work for the First Alaskans Institute with some amazing people and to be here with you this evening. And we are all four of us zooming in from four different locations across the United States, two from Alaska, two from the lower 48. So I just want to start by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, it is so important to honor all of the indigenous people for the lands that we are on all the time, but not just uh, when we're having these events. And Laganai is zooming in from Hlinket Ani, otherwise known as Juno. And Fran is zooming in from New Orleans, which is the land of the Choctaw people. And Bill, you are zooming in from Omaha, and I'm gonna do my best to pronounce this correctly. Um, Omaha Ocheti Sakowin, the Sioux people. And I am zooming zooming in from my homelands, which is the Shukbiak Island of Kodiak. Lagunai. Yeah. Um, also acknowledging the fact that this is unceded virtual territory for all of us. And um, we we're here because this is the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act on December 18th. Uh, 1971. And throughout the year, we've been incorporating into all of our gatherings um, at First Alaskans Institute, a moment of recognition to just recognize what that means, what that means for us as Native people, um, the impacts that it has had on us and still have on us today, and those impacts will it will have on us in the future. And so often when we think about the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, uh, people think of it as a very final, like this was settled um, back in 1971. But in fact, ANCSA itself as a piece of federal legislation is one of the most amended pieces of federal legislation. And there are still critical elements of the legislation that passed in 1971 that have still not been fulfilled today some of those promises that were part of that or some of the land um, transactions that were part of it were, are still not settled as of today. And so it's a living thing. Uh, and a lot of people haven't really had a chance to start understanding what that means. Getting some viewpoint of what it looks like for our native community um, as a native organization um, and as a, as a really um, small state in terms of our population, there is no place in Alaska untouched by this legislation. Um, but the way that it touches us is usually only talked about in terms of Alaska Native people. And um, while that is important and significant, there's a part of that story that really hasn't had a chance to kind of be told and be understood um, in the way that it really needs to. And so today for our ANCSA University Coffee Time, we invited former Governor Bill Walker, former Lieutenant Governor Fran Almer, 
uh, to join us in a conversation about who else were beneficiaries of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Um, and we're so honored that you both have taken time to join us, um, both uh, proud Alaskans who are uh, visiting family in other parts of the country. And um, I, Melissa, you just totally were so fast looking up where they were at. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I just really want to quickly just say of both of our guests, Punish um, Chish, how us so much for um, for joining us and taking time with us to have this conversation, because people really haven't had a chance to think about um, who all the beneficiaries are of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Oftentimes, we only actually get to hear um, or see or are told a very small portion of who those beneficiaries are. Um, and, and you two in the roles that you've served in, extensive roles, um, locally, regionally, statewide, um, across the country and internationally, you guys have a much um, deeper awareness and understanding of just who the beneficiaries of ANCSA have been. And, um, and it is to that question that we invited you both to join us. Um, I, wanna, I wanna say that, um, Bill, you've been a governor of our state from 2014 to 2018. You've been in private practice as an attorney. Um, you've been a mayor. Uh, you and Fran have that in common. Fran, you were a mayor of Juneau at one point, right? Um, also, something that I get to know because I see you on Facebook a lot is that you're a really good carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> and then Fran, you've served as Lieutenant Governor. You've been the Chancellor of the University of Alaska Anchorage. You've served as the Chair of the US Arctic Research Commission. Um, and you're currently the Chair of the Global Board of Directors for the Nature Conservancy. And um, and it was all of those things and more. It was also the fact that you folks consistently show up in trying to be good and in good relations with our native community. And that's really important because it means that you're actually broadening your own viewpoint and really watching and thinking about all of these things from a, from a different angle. So our, our first question to both of you, um, is essentially, why did you say yes to us when we invited you to be a part of this conversation? And um, we'll go to uh, Bill first and then Fran, if that's okay with you folks. And just kick off. Well, and you know, by way of introduction, my, my uh, Clinkett name is uh, Guchwak. I was uh, honored to be adopted by the Kaguantan the clan, the Eagle Nest clan. And um, so that's, uh, that I am Bill Walker and I'm, uh, how, how would you say no to something like this? Because it is an honor to be asked uh, and it is such a profound impact on our state, the ANCTA settlement, I mean, the entire state to this day. And I'm, I'm excited about being part of this because as governor, I had some interesting experiences that um, uh, some in the Oval Office, uh, some in Alaska, that I was able to share the huge success of, of what ANCSA created in, in, our, in our incredible state and, and, and does today and, and will continue on. So we are in an anomaly in some respects. Uh, and I, I'm very proud of, of, um, um, of the successes and what, and, and be able to have told that story. So I was, I've, I've been wanting to tell some of this uh, anyway. So now this is a great opportunity to, because it is very unique. And so thank you for the invitation and, and always, uh, a great honor to uh, share any 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 activity with uh, uh, one the wonderful uh, Fran Ulmer, uh, senior a senior uh, at Harvard. Uh, you are you 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 do it all, Fran, and so it's it's really an honor to be one of the four. And, and Melissa, good to see you. I remember when I first met you in Kodiak, and so uh, good to uh, good to see you as well. So thank you, thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much, Bill, for the kind words. Thank you for the invitation. And like Bill, I am honored to be an adopted Tlingit. I My name is Kinzey uh, Eagle Kaguantan. And it has been a very important part of my life in Alaska. 
to have the opportunity to really be welcomed, educated, included, and in many ways participate in a much more meaningful experience as an Alaskan because of the way in which the Alaska Native community really throughout the state has opened up their hearts, their minds, their hands, their arms, their homes, and said, friend, we are happy to help you understand the complexity of the cultures of Alaska. And that has been a life blessing for me. Uh, so why did I say yes? Well, kind of like Bill, I'm very happy to participate in this conversation with you all, but also it gave me an opportunity to reflect on the 50 years since ANCSA was adopted. It just, it kind of uh, centered me on a topic that, yes, of course, I was aware of the fact that it was 1971 and, and yes, it was a long time ago, but by asking us to have this conversation with you, I think it gave both Bill and me a chance to really sit back for a moment and say, what difference has it made? What difference has it made for the entire state, for many people, many businesses, and, and for ourselves personally? So, Gunash uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity to just share a few ideas with you all. Yeah, wonderful. And um, as you were introducing yourselves as uh, both adopted uh, Kaguantan, um, it made me really curious about your names too, and and the fact that you know in our in our Tlingit way that means that you folks are brother and sister. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so we always have a relationship. Indeed, we do. You know, one of the things that I think is so amazing about Alaska, uh, for Thousands of years, Alaska symbolizes diversity. And, it, you know, recently we've kind of forgotten what that really means and what a strength that diversity is. And, um, you know, I think about how different our, our Native nations are from one another. Um, and that that difference means that Alaska is stronger because of it. And there's so much that we can learn and incorporate because of that difference in knowledge and that um, those different ways of engaging with the land and waters around us. At the end of the day, ANCSA was a Land Settlement Act. And for our Native people, uh, there's a framing that is often used. And I'm gonna share that framing. We hear it a lot. We hear it in newspaper articles, on TV interviews. We hear it in classes <clears throat> in the university if they, if they actually talk about ANCSA. We, we hear this framing of um, Alaska Natives received 44 million acres of land. They received a billion dollar settlement. But in our native world, we were not given anything. We had stuff taken away from us. We had a lot of stuff taken away from us. And, and words are important. And as we were thinking about who are the folks that we want to have a conversation with to help other Alaskans and others who now call Alaska home or who are transacting and doing business here, who are folks who can help them get a much broader sense of what it really means to be an Alaskan in the context of a conversation about ANCSA at 50 and what the, the, um, the Land Claim Settlement Act really has meant for Alaska. And so I, I wanna open with that kind of broad question and please would, whoever would like to jump in, um, you know, who are some of the primary beneficiaries of the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act? Well, you know, it, it's always tempting to start with some numbers, and I can't resist that temptation because of the years I spent at the Institute of Social and Economic Research. <laughs> so forgive me, but, but it's pretty amazing. If you think about 12 regional corporations, over 200 village corporations own 
92% of all of the private land in Alaska. Think about that for a minute. The rest of the land is you know, federal or state. So if you're thinking about who has a control opportunity, wise use and well done management that is consistent with the values of traditional native people, it is pretty overwhelming what ANCSA did. And ANCSA as one of one many, there were many, many laws that were adopted in the early 70s and 80s that have had a profound impact. But when you look at the economic power of both the regional and the village corporations, the, the numbers of people they hire and employ, the numbers of businesses that they have started, embraced, invested in, partnered with, um, you know, you can make an excellent case based on the numbers. I won't go into a lot of them, but based on just the numbers, the economy of Alaska is much more vibrant today, much more diversified and much more Alaska based as opposed to outside interests. We have Alaska native corporations running these businesses, hiring people, training people and providing economic opportunity. So it's, you know, it's pretty powerful if you look at the diversification, the dividends that are paid, the money of businesses that are nationally and globally that you bring back through the native corporations to spend in Alaska. Um, you know, it, it's been a powerful economic engine that has made a huge difference, I would argue, for not only the economy, but all Alaskans. We've talked a lot about diversifying the economy for as long as I've lived here, which is the early 70s. And the Alaska Native Corporations have done an extraordinary amount of getting us to a much more diversified economy than we were before. So um, I think it's hard to find somebody who isn't in some way benefited by what happened with the creation of the native corporations. Now I realize not everybody is aware of it. Not everybody maybe feels it. Not everybody works for a native corporation, but the energy and the economic activity that is happening in our state as a result of that, yes, we're all benefiting. Over to you, Bill. Well, I won't ask you to speak first again because you would do it so well, you have little to add, but what I will say is this, um, you know, anchors that open up Alaska. I mean, I, I really believe that. I remember when, when it passed because when it was signed, because I was a couple of years out of high school, starting to work on the oil pipeline. <clears throat> I honestly don't believe we would have had that pipeline built or finished without the settlement. And that, oh, and, and you, so you look at what the pipeline has done for Alaska, that wouldn't have happened, but for Anxa. And so that was really opened up Alaska like we had, had never seen it before. Um, you know, the creation of the, of the 12, of 12 regional corporations, the 13th of, of out of state, but the 12, what's unique about those corporations <clears throat> is that they are international corporations and they do business all over the world, but they bring their money back to Alaska. <clears throat> that has not been the Alaskan model. The model we have seen is that come to Alaska, harvest Alaska, send the, sport, send the, the wealth outside of Alaska, and then they're gone. So here we have 12 corporations that do just the opposite of that. And it wouldn't have happened but for, for ANCSA. So everybody in Alaska, everybody has benefited from ANCSA because of, <clears throat> of what it did for the state. I mean, we'd just be a very different state without that. And so it's a... <clears throat> it's, I've had um, some in interesting discussions about that with, uh, uh, with a couple of presidents uh, uh, and explaining the, uh, su the success of, of that. Now, that doesn't necessarily come along with the relationships. And the relationships are critical. And relationships are earned. And the, you know, they're not bought and paid for, they're earned. And that's why uh, we... we you know, began the uh, 
Governor's Tribal Advisory Council so that the tribes would have um, a direct seat at the table and, and not have to go through somebody else to have those, those, that, those relationships. So uh, ANCSA, it just opened up the state. Like, like we would just be such a different state today if that had not been, uh, been resolved. And, and it, but in a way that it was like an incredible investment uh, in the future of Alaska because of what, what is coming back every day. And so it's, it's a, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge success story. It's one that is, you know, Liz, you're absolutely correct. It's changes, you know, it gets amended. It's a, it's a you know, it's, it's a piece of legislation and it has been amended many times, um, but uh, it's one that is a, it's a foundation of, and I, you know, certainly knew um, uh, several of those uh, individuals that were involved in, in, uh, in negotiating that. And uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendous story of what they did uh, and in the amount of time that it was done in. I mean, it didn't, it didn't go on for decades. I mean, it was relatively a short period of time given the magnitude of what was being you know, dealt with and whatnot. So that's a, a phenomenal story. And I've heard some of them, the stories firsthand from those that were there and what an honor that was to, to hear that. So it's, uh, um, I'm, I can't say enough good about what ANCS has done for every Alaskan, everybody that receives a, a dividend, everybody that receives, you know, you know, a, you know, you know, a job in any industry in Alaska where there's tourism, which, which uh, uh, certainly a lot in, in the in resource development and everything, and in, in, in climate change issues, um, ANCSA is is a, is a foundation for much of that. Well, and that's kind of what I really want to do with both of you tonight too, is peel that onion a bit. Um, when we think about the people who benefited from ANCSA, people think about Alaska Natives, but they don't really understand how ANCSA actually really benefited the state government. Mm -hmm. They benefited the federal government, um, but we don't really hear about it talked about in that paradigm. Um, the other paradigm we don't really hear it talked about is how it benefited um, industry. We hear about oil, um, and, and I think some, you know, there's a lot of people who understand that the dividend, the permanent fund um, connected to oil is therefore a byproduct of this Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, but they don't hear that story and they don't understand it. Um, and, and same with, you know, all of the other industries that have been able to thrive here. You know, I think about, you know, I think about the transportation industry. You know, how was that impacted by the passage of ANCSA and the allowance of the building of the pipeline? I think about the banking industry in Alaska. I think about the education system in Alaska. I think about our higher education system and the role of the nonprofits, the Alaska Native corporations um, that form the nonprofits who then are generating all of this, not only scholarship money, but other sponsorships and contributions into those systems. And so I wanna, I wanna ask, you know, is there one industry in particular that you might be connected to um, that you wanna talk a little bit about how it has impacted that industry or that sector? Uh, you know, when I think a lot about um, environmental and conservation organizations, I think about how much they have benefited from the passage of ANCSA as well. So just to put that question out there. Yeah, let me jump in with the tourism industry just as an example. Um, you know, Liz, you're, you're sitting there in Juneau and you know that the Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation has built this beautiful new building downtown. It has this extraordinary gift shop with amazing works of art. And that whole aspect of the cultural <laughs> experience for our visitors, which is enriched by the way in which the Alaskan Native communities have come <coughs> forward with experiences. Think about Huna. You know, Huna developed this 
really remarkable port for the cruise ship industry, right? And people go there and they learn about the culture, they see dances, they see people in regalia, they also walk the lands, they hear stories about the history associated with both the Huna area, but also Glacier Bay when the people from Huna had to move out of Glacier Bay, you know, and, and you go to the Glacier Bay National Park and you see the beautiful totem house that has been built with a partnership between the Park Service and the Huna tribe. You know, so I'll, I could go on and on. There are a lot of examples just because I lived in Southeast for 30 years, I, I tend to think of that, but it's elsewhere as well. And so when you think about the extent to which the tourism industry, not for the last two years under COVID, but way before that, and hopefully again, the way in which tourists come to understand Alaska is then not just mountains and beautiful scenery, but beautiful people, beautiful culture, and a really whole set of stories that they can take home with them. So that's just one example. And no, it's not only the, it's not only angst that made that possible, but in many ways, it is what angst made possible because of both land and cash and empowerment and, and training and education, which equipped people to be able to run these businesses, which also benefits all of the other people in the tourism industry. So that's just one example. Let, let me give a, a, a little example of, on the resource development. I had a, um, the honor of um, testifying before the Senate Energy Committee uh, along with our, our delegation on oil development up north. And um, the questions that came, uh, we were on one panel, the next panel, um, it was a Richard Glenn of uh, ASRC, uh, Aaron Shutt of Doyon and, and, and several others. Um, the questions came up from some of the senators from the East Coast about drilling techniques and all the problems and this and that. And it was interesting watching you know, uh, Aaron Shutt go up and walk them through the way things are done, uh, some of the safety issues that they that they do, and, and just the technology of, of that. Um, after that, I had a chance, I was in the Oval Office on Energy Week, talking about energy projects in Alaska. And the, the president said, um, well, but what, how are you going to deal with the indigenous uh, people in Alaska on these projects? And I just smiled and I said, well, Mr. President, um, um, they will be at the table. And quite honestly, we will be at their table. And because that's the way we do it in Alaska, because they are the companies that, that are involved and do the best job on, on resource development. So about six months later, Secretary Mnuchin, Secretary of Treasury, um, wanted to stop in Alaska. He called and, and, and asked where can he meet me in Alaska to talk about uh, resource development. And I said, Fairbanks. And so when he came to Fairbanks, we had a meeting uh, at the Doyon um, headquarters and Aaron Shutt uh, uh, hosted us there. And I had uh, five of the Angsta Corporation presidents, CEOs there. There was uh, Atna, Doyon, uh, Calista, um, uh, Siri, um, and, and Nana. And they talked about what they do on resource development. And, and Secretary Mnuchin was just shocked. He, was, he just had no idea that uh, of, of what, what has uh, grown up in Alaska and what we've become. If you wanna reach out to the experts, you reach out to the, to the, the ANCTA corporations that, that, that do that work and do it very, very well. And so it's, it is unique. And so there's an industry that is um, um, very much Im impacted and benefited uh, our state as a result of their of their uh, uh, their expertise, and 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 they do it elsewhere in the world. But again, I love it that they bring their their you know their profits back home uh, to uh, to share with uh, with shareholders and in other ways in, in in the state. So it's a it, it is a I have not found any place else in the world that has that unique relationship uh, on that industry uh, with indigenous people. I just I, I don't think anybody else has that. And so that's a, that was a, a proud moment for me to, to 
to explain that to the president. And um, actually I've done it with two presidents and also have them actually see it in person um, at the, uh, in, in Fairbanks at the Doyon headquarters. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I really appreciate how you expanded on um, how Alaska Native corporations bring, our, bring the revenue back to our state versus harvesting from our state. I love the, the terminology that you used with that, and I appreciate that point. So both of you have held top leadership positions within our state government. So can you tell us a little bit from your perspective of how our Alaska Native corporations have impacted the economy in our state, specifically to state government? I'm happy to to uh, to, to lead off with that. Um, you know, their their impact, uh, the Ankta Corporation impact on our state government is is really is, is with incredible number of jobs that they have created. I mean, Fran mentioned about tourism and, and, and all that is developed there was just it's just phenomenal the growth of that. They create a tremendous number of jobs. And you know, I have long said that um, one of the best cures for many social ills in Alaska is a job. And if a person has a job, they just have a different lifestyle, they have purpose, they have direction. And, and the ancient corporations have, have done a tremendous uh, amount in that regard. What they do on, on uh, I never forget my visit to uh, uh, the Red Dog Mine. Um, you know, I, 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 I visit every mine in Alaska and I'm a little bit of a stickler for local hire and uh, a little bit more than a little stickler, I'm passionate about local hire. So at every mine, I would I would talk to various people. Where you're from, and I heard a lot of, you know, you know, Colorado, you know, Idaho, Washington, etc. So at Red Dog, which is of course Nana a Nana a Corporation uh, ownership, uh, when we got there, we went in at uh, it was lunch. And I said, let's not have a big power table. It's just everybody split up. Find another table because it, it was lunch and everybody. So we split up into individuals, and and I sat down at one table, and this young lady was there. And, and she was very excited. She got a promotion that day. And I said, and where are you from? And she just smiled. She pointed, she said, 20 miles that way. And I just was so happy to have finally met that, that somebody had that answer, that they were, they were lived in a nearby village and they had a job and they were, you know, it's just, that was a dream come true for me. That's the model that I, and, and you only, I only found that. But honestly, I'm not sure, I'm sure there are others. I didn't talk to everybody in every mind. I'm not picking on the minds at all, but I'm just, I found that. A significant difference at at, uh, at Red Dog, and, and because so I just think I think that um, so what you what for state government it is it has certainly created the you know, the royalty revenue so no there's no question about that but really it's the the the, the big benefit is the, the job creation and and the focus on the focus on Alaskans and 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 you know shareholders and how can they you know you know, raise the, the quality of life in, uh, in the region that they're working. So yes, it was a, there, I could go on and on, but I'm not. Um, Fran, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is for a while, I had the opportunity and honor of serving on the Siri Foundation Board and had the opportunity there to see personally the way in which the funding supports scholarships and young people being able to obtain the necessary education and training to get those jobs that Bill is talking about. So that pipeline of the corporation makes money, it shares some of that money with its nonprofits and foundations, which then create opportunities through scholarships and training programs, which then means those young people can go to work and keep that cycle going. So it's another aspect of kind of a local hire thing Bill was talking about, but it's the way ANCSA corporations support that growing their own, educating, training people that will stay. They won't, well, obviously some leave. There's, you know, that's just life, but it, it's another piece of the ANCSA heritage, so to speak, that scholarship opportunity and that training for jobs that are relevant to that corporation or a different corporation's business enterprise. And I think that's a pretty powerful piece of growing the kind of state that we all want to live in. I was, um, I was thinking about a couple of the examples that you shared and 
I'm wondering if we could kind of drill down a little bit more. <laughs> we'll just keep using these resource, <laughs> <laughs> the pipeline. <laughs> drill down. Um, I want to I want to ask this question in a different way. Um, if we think about the beneficiaries of the passage of this legislation, and we don't think about what Alaska Natives received, if we don't think about what our corporations have been able to do, if we don't think about um, what our, our um, uh, Native organizations have been able to do, but we, we think instead about everyone else in Alaska now and what they've received, I wanna talk a little bit more about that and, and kind of tug on that, that thread a bit because I don't think that people have an opportunity to really understand that part of it. And, um, and I feel like we're doing a disservice to our communities and to our Alaskans when we don't connect the dots for them. But for ANCSA, what would not have been possible? And, um, and I'm thinking about all of these different kinds of things that we have manifested now, when if we go back to what was happening at the time, part of the crucible or the, the perfect storm, I guess, of events that were happening that led up to the passage of ANCSA, you had the state um, engaged in selecting lands and um, a land freeze was put in place because they had not, and the federal government had not addressed our native land rights. So when I think about, okay, so if, if ANCSA hadn't happened the way that it did, how would that issue have transpired or not? Well, we can't really go back in time and, and figure that out, but we can now do the cost benefit analysis on the benefit that the state received. You know, um, the state received how many millions of acres of land, has made how much money off of its governance processes, um, how many city governments and local governments and boroughs were set up under state, under the state passage, and their ability to have those lands. And, um, and I don't know that people are really um, able to understand that that level of kind of impact of what ANCSA shaped. Because without ANCSA, we wouldn't have had the same structure that we have now. But now that we do, we can kind of sit back and think a little bit about, about those quote unquote, quote unquote benefits that the state received. And to Melissa's question and, and to the things that you folks were, were sharing, I wanna just kind of go down a little bit deeper and, and talk a little bit more about that. So if you could share your, um, your insight into the ways that the state and the local government systems have benefited with the lands that it received from ANCSA. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's limitless. I mean, it, I mean, but, but with in specific, certainly, you know, local governments receive revenue sharing, you know, and the revenue sharing, Alaska is a different model than any other state is that because the, the mineral right typically belong in, in, the, in a private sector and then the local local governments would have a piece of that if that's in their in their region and under the Alaska model it all goes to the to the state revenue on the royalty side and then it comes back and that's why we do we do we as a state provide services in Alaska and different communities that you wouldn't see that in lower 48 it's just it's just a different model and so you know without that land uh, for the state that's really what has funded um, you know, since, uh, since the, you know, the, the late 70s, uh, you know, has, we've been the lion's share of, of the funding of, of the state. In fact, it funded everything almost. And so it really is, um, um, you really can't come up with an example of any development in Alaska that it wasn't somehow tied back to the, the root um, uh, benefit from, uh, from ANCSA. And I really believe that, you know, Alaska has sort of benefited in some way from various, you know, crises that have taken place. And the energy crisis is what, you know, provided that the, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was built. 
But if there had been a long delay, I, and because we couldn't get that resolved, then I don't think, I think it would have stopped because they would have found, you know, the, then the price of oil was coming down and, and, you know, other fines, et cetera. So I think that, I think that if it had not been, you know, for inks, I think we would well, envision an Alaska without an oil pipeline. Just, just, just move, move that from, from the equation over the years, what kind of a university system, what kind of, you know, we, would have, we wouldn't have had much of the infrastructure that we have now. So it really is, it really is the, the foundation in many respects for the, you know, the tremendous surge of development that, that, we, that we have seen. And it's interesting now that, you know, that the, you know, you know, Alaska makes a lot of investments and, and uh, one of the best investments was, that, and I know the federal government, you know, uh, paid approximately half of the, uh, uh, on the angst of settlement um, uh, and the state paid the other half, and it was one of the best investments we made because of what what grew from it. I mean, look at the fishing industry; uh, tremendous involvement with Anxa Corporation in the fishing industry. So, I mean, you can't touch any industry in Alaska or any any economic piece that isn't somehow connected uh, with uh, with Anxa. I mean, I, I really believe that. I don't mean to. I know I'm repeating myself. But it really, I, 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 feel, I feel strongly about that. You know, as, as you were talking, uh, and I was looking at the background behind you, Liz, I noticed, you know, the, the we, you mentioned that your dad had done weaving right there behind you for your mom. It's like all of these things are woven together. You know, I'm thinking about a blanket or a basket where you pull one thread and the whole thing falls apart. You know, you pull out one spruce root from a basket and all of a sudden it isn't the basket that it was and it becomes weaker. And ANCSA kind of like our Alaska constitution, kind of like, you know, there are a lot of interwoven things that have provided the destiny that we have experienced, right? There isn't one thing, it's, it's, they're all interwoven. Would they be radically different, but for ANCSA? Yes, radically different. Exactly how, I don't really know, but I agree with Bill. It would, we would not have the vibrant economy that we have today had ANCSA not passed, but also had the corporations not evolved in the way in which they did. Because, I mean, like, well, not everybody on this call is as old as, as I am or Bill is, um, but let me just say, I, I got here in 1973. So two years after INCSA, the corporations were really just getting their act together. And let's be perfectly honest, they weren't all getting their act together. It took a while. I mean, some of them failed for a while before they rebounded. Some of them took off like a rocket. Some of them struggled. But over time, the incredible development of not only the vision that is, the, as I understand it, the, the three principal things, obtaining profit and sharing that with shareholders, preserving culture, and sharing that only not with cultures today, but you know, with the people today, but for all times. And number three, having the kind of opportunity for nonprofits to do the kinds of things like scholarship and other things. So if you think about what they have been able to achieve in those arenas, in addition to diverse, helping to diversify Alaska's economy with such strength, pulling out the thread or the spruce root from the basket without ANCSA, I cannot tell you what the state would look like, but it would be nowhere near as vibrant as it is today. And I am grateful. I am grateful that the people who worked so hard at the beginning to negotiate it and then get it and then develop the corporations and evolve into something that has had such widespread benefit. Again, I, I just think all Alaskans, not just 
current Alaskans, but future Alaskans are in a much better place because of it. And, you know, when, when you ask us to drill down, I, I, it's Bill and I think are both struggling because we'd love to have some numbers. We'd love to have more specific examples. And I'll tell you what's going through my head right now, which is it would be fabulous if first Alaskans and ICER at UAA would do some sort of a joint project that would actually do more quantification of some of the things that we've talked about in general terms, but actually could do kind of an update. They did something back um, either the 40th or the 45th, I can't remember which one that was kind of a session that attempted to review what difference did ANCSA make. But I don't know, it just strikes me that that some sort of a convening and some sort of a paper that would take a slightly deep a slightly deeper dive into exactly what you are hoping that we will say. We wish we knew more how to quantify that. I think it would be extremely valuable to have that as part of the Alaska history lesson for the future, as well as for those of us who are living here now, as we reflect on not only what a difference it's made, but also how we can be better partners in supporting the success because it benefits all of us. Yeah, I appreciate that um, for, for many reasons. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation because we really have to have a much better understanding and we're just starting to tease that out um, because we've been, we've, we've been the recipients of a story. And that story is that Alaska Natives were given 44 million acres of land, a billion dollars, and we were able to have these corporations set up and look at how amazing this, this act has been for Alaska Native people. But the whole side of the story that, that tells us who else benefited, and in fact, were the main beneficiaries of that passage, is not talked about. I would have loved as a young person in my early 20s when I was in college, I would have loved to have been told about how Alaska has been able to do what it's done and, and have been told about what Alaska natives had taken from them in order to set the future of Alaska um, up in the way that it has experienced. I would have benefited from that kind of storytelling greatly because it took me so long to try to see the forest for the trees. <clears throat> when I think about all of these other industries and people who have unfortunately not had a chance to really understand our native community. Um, and so they have uh, mistaken notions, um, too often stereotypes, um, and uh, too, too many of those embedded in really um, kind of wrongful race-based notions of who we are as Native people. They don't see us, and they should, because one, we're, our peoples are amazing and our testament to the strength of Alaska, but two, we had so much taken from us and put on us that, and that people don't really get to hear that side of the story and they don't get to understand really how they are in fact really benefiting from this. Um, and, and as a result, we see all kinds of issues across the state from local government issues, misunderstandings of what ANCSA is and what it isn't, a lack of knowledge about what tribes are, what they do, the services they provide, um, one of the things that you shared as you talked about the benefits the state received was around the royalties and the way that those royalties became revenue shares to the local city governments. Those did not go to the tribal governments. The tribal governments don't collect taxes. They don't collect royalties. How does a government function without taxes? You know, and so there's so many things that are hidden from people and it just I just really enjoy and appreciate that you folks are willing to help us peel that onion a bit 
because we are thinking about being able to tell that story, but we first we have to understand what it is and start seeing it so we could shape um, shape our conversations and um, how we think about it and how we get that story told. I think about the banking industry in Alaska. What would the banking industry in Alaska look like now if we didn't have this massive investment coming into Alaska at a time when Alaska was almost bankrupt, right, as a state? prior to, as it was rolling into statehood and then prior to ANCSA, this was, this was a massive investment um, that many people are still benefiting from today. And I don't know that they know, you know, if they're employees of the banks in Alaska, the major banks that have been able to be here and prof prosper, um, all the contract businesses to the pipeline, the transportation corridors that have been created, the energy corridors that have been created. So as I've been kind of teasing that out a little bit more in, um, in the way that I think about it, I'm just really curious about your, your thoughts to kind of go a little deeper in, um, in your mind from what you've seen. I can tell you what I've experienced as one person, but I haven't had the breadth of exposure to all of these industries. And well, quite frankly, they're lobbyists as you have. <laughs> 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 so, um, so what, what do you, what do you think, um, you know, in terms of all of these other industries that have been benefiting, you know, how, how do we help tell their story what what has your experience been you know i i think that uh what helped me uh, tremendously was i served with two incredible um alaskans as uh, lieutenant governors um uh, byron malott and valerie davidson and um it was a journey it was a journey with with them and it was um very special um as they spoke um, with passion, never with notes, um, always from the heart. It was never uh, some, some, somebody one time referenced uh, as they, the off, off the cuff remarks. No, those are not off the cuff. That's, that's from the heart. And, and we listened. And, and it was, uh, we were a better, a much better administration because of the, uh, those that made up our team, and and certainly Byron and and Val and a long list Barbara Blake a long list of of um, uh, Alaska natives that they just made us better and, and and but it's about a relationship you know and and you know the the way that GTAC was created was that we were in lots of litigation. Uh, the state was, and I, that that bothered me. That you know, let's let's see if some of this can be resolved. And so we went and, and traveled to um, five of the of the villages and and sat down with them. We we took a you know a case of vegetables, and we went to listen. And it was very uncomfortable for you know the attorney general's office and and other you know because I'm an attorney that I thought I was trying, I was going to go try to settle. I said I'm not going to settle anything. I'm going to go and listen. And that's what we did. We went to all five that were litigants. And we listened to why they were in this litigation, what their issues were, and it was it was an eye opening to do that. Attorneys aren't very good listeners. I'm not picking on attorneys. I know they friends well, so we all you know. But but we're not trained to be listeners. We're listen, We're trained to respond. And so that's I came back from those those three days of, of travel. And I said, we need, we need, a, we, we have a relationship with the Alaska Native community and it's not a good one. I want to have a, a good relationship between the state and the Alaska Native community. And that's when we started the Governor's Tribal Advisory Council for that very reason. And, and so um, it, it, it's, there's so much to be learned when you're talking to each other rather than about each other. There's so much to be learned when you're sitting around a coffee table and not in a courtroom. And so what we attempted to do, and my, my brother Richard Peterson is a, is a good example. We've had some rough and tumble uh, you know, conversations that needed to be had. 
And, and, but because we had a relationship other than that, we were able to work through that. And um, I remember a number of times that there were a call on a Friday evening and something had come up and we were able to you know, convene a, a few members of, of GTAC and the administration and we were able to resolve it um, you know, that quickly because we had a relationship. So I think that's the part that sometimes is missed is the importance. I mean, you know, you know dollars and cents and numbers are, are one thing but it's the relationships that really um, brings people together. And you know, there's no drive up window for a relationship. You, you earn it and you have to develop that trust and you have to be willing to um, take some risks associated with that. Uh, but the rewards are, are phenomenal. I can, I, I can tell you, I, was a, I, I came out of office a very different person than I went in because of relationships that I that I I made in that in that in those four years, and and many of them were not in the in the Capitol, uh, they were not in my office. It was uh, um, it was around a table in one of the villages, listening to um, and feeling the passion of the issues that they were concerned about, on the on the language issue and, and the loss of the uh, of the languages. I um, mean, just it's just. It was very, a very powerful, uh, rewarding, difficult, painful times, but it was, it was, it was so worth it. It was so worth it. So it, it, to me, it's all about relationships. And if you establish relationship, um, things just tend to work out differently when you've established a relationship first. And, and that's, I think that's sometimes is missed. And, um, and so as far as not understanding, um, I, I, I think that's true. I think there is a lot of misunderstanding of, 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 of how angst is, is one example, but I think it goes much further than that as far as, you know, you know in, in, uh, I'll never forget in New Wixit, you know, when they, what they did in order to, you know, secure their land, you know, to come over and, and to, to live for 18 months in a tent uh, out of Utiavik, they came over and said, it was just phenomenal what they did and what, you know, to acquire rights to land. So it's a, it's a powerful, um, it's a powerful message, powerful story, but in, 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 in it, 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 you can read about it and that's one thing, but to hear it firsthand, it's, you don't forget it's not what the words are said, it's what you, it makes you feel and realize. And you might not remember the words exactly, but you remember a feeling. And that's, that's I think, sometimes it's what is missed in, in, this, in, this, um, in the history of it. And, and one, more, one more quick example is that I met with a class of students there. I think they were, they were high school, like sophomore, junior, from Palmer. And they went to Buckland and their counterparts in Buckland went to Palmer. They had an exchange for about, it was about two weeks. It was not a weekend. It was about two weeks. And those kids from Palmer were so excited about what they experienced in Buckland. They just absolutely couldn't stop talking about it. And, and certainly the ones from Buckland enjoyed their time in Palmer. Of course they did. But is that kind of and, and, and those were the relationships that um, just continued on and, 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 and will continue on. So it's about, it's a, for me, it's all about relationships. You know, at the, at the time of the earthquake in Valdez, we had two of the Baker girls from Kotzebue uh, lived with us uh, for a couple of years. And uh, my dad knew Bob Baker and, and whatnot. And so it just, it's just about relationships. And, and, and so I think that's really, I think the, to me, it's the secret sauce of how you deal with the tough issues is that you can deal with a tough issue differently if you have that relationship first. And, and if you don't have a relationship, then it's the old fashioned way and it goes to court and the attorneys win. So um, longer answer than you probably wanted, Liz, but I'm sorry, <laughs> I feel pretty strongly about that, so. No, Bill, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking about some of those tough relationships around subsistence, you know, working on the Katie John case and mm -hmm. working on 
Mm -hmm. What we had attempted to do in terms of a constitutional amendment to protect a rural subsistence priority. I mean, we made progress with people when we had the opportunity to have those face to face, but you know, you can't get to everybody, unfortunately. And it's really hard sometimes to get beyond the pre-existing mindset. I don't care whether you're talking about a subsistence issue or Alaska Native corporations and who do they benefit? You know, people end up with these kind of ideas in their heads. And sometimes if you have the opportunity to sit over a cup of coffee around a table, you can get to a very different level of sharing and mutual understanding. Uh, I know personally, I mean, I felt very, very, very fortunate when I first moved to Juneau that people like Bessie Vizaya and others kind of adopted me mentally, emotionally, culturally, and took the time to help me understand what was so complicated about the path that Alaska Natives had tread. Um, Agnes Bellinger, who is a docent at the, the museum, you know, I mean, Agnes patiently helped me understand things that I, you know, I suppose I could have read about it, but it, it's different when you have those relationships and when people take the time to share with you at a personal level. I mean, that, that's why I first joined the Alaska Native Sisterhood in Juneau, you know, because I, there were people who welcomed me in and developed the relationships. Um, you know, I was thinking about, oh golly, the, the Native leaders that I got to meet as, as basically a kid in the early 70s, you know, John Borbridge and Roger Lane and John Schaefer and Evan Hobson and Caleb Pungawi. I could go on and on and on. They were patiently willing to share culture. And that is a piece of the equation that somehow the busy world that we live in right now seems to gloss over in a way that makes it increasingly difficult for people with different points of view to find common ground. I mean, this is not just in Alaska. This is unfortunately the, the era we seem to be living in, which is kind of sad. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what exactly we do about that, uh, but you're right, Bill relationships, taking time to listen, finding those common areas of mutual understanding and being able to share from the heart of what it is that is both painful, but also beautiful. Yeah, that is cheese. I think, um, I think that that's an, an area that's really interesting to explore as well. Um, to your question earlier, Fran, about a study um, we're actually engaged in one, and um, and the way that we're thinking about it is how we how we tell the story of Alaska's stewardship by its indigenous people through time, and and one of the pieces that um, I was thinking about as you were both talking was the the parts of the equation that we're trying to solve for the missing parts. The parts that a lot of people don't see because they don't actually get to hear it. We use this, um, this awareness test in our Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity. And, um, and this awareness test is a way for people to understand the, essentially it's kind of letting people have a better understanding of how much control your unconscious actually has on what you see and what you understand. Um, and what a huge role, the way that we have been blinded to the strengths of Alaska Native people in Alaska, the way that we've been blinded to those things, the way that we've only heard one part of the story uh, about ANCSA, um, and it has built resentment in non-Alaska Native peoples, because they're only told that Alaska Native people have benefited from it, and they feel left out, they feel resentful about that when in fact they're the largest beneficiaries of the passage of this Land Claims Act. 
And, and it's to that, that I'm curious in your minds, I guess, I, I know part of that answer is relationship and education. We have to, in order to have a respectful relationship, we have to understand. Um, but I'm really curious about the other components that people aren't getting to hear about that because of this seminal legislation at a crucible time in Alaska's history, we have um, benefits. I guess the term might even be privileges that people haven't had a chance to really see and understand how that impacts them. And some of them are connected directly to ANCSA. Some of them are not though. Some of them are connected to the presence of our tribes in Alaska. And so I'm curious in your minds, like what are some of those unseen privileges that Alaskans are the beneficiaries of, but they may not get a chance to hear all the time. And, and I, wanna, I wanna kind of push you to think about um, the industries or the sectors the, the NGOs, the environmental conservation orgs, the churches, all those other kinds of entities that are not necessarily Alaska Native corporations formed under ANCSA. So as you, as you think about those things, I'm gonna share a story because I want you guys to think about it and give you time to think about that. If we had not had a land claims, what would our hunting and fishing management regime look like now? If you know Alaska Native people, you know that the two things that we care most about are ways of life, our hunting, fishing, harvesting, and gathering, and our children. And the way that the current state and federal management system works over our hunting and fishing has excluded Native people from being in those management decision-making seats. And so for us, as Native people, this is a huge area that non-Alaska Natives have benefited from. Do you see what I'm getting at? Um, they've benefited from the way that this uh, legislation has been interpreted. And they're benefiting from all the ways, you know, I think Fran, was it you that mentioned commercial fisheries or was that you, Bill? I think I did, yeah. yeah that was earlier on in the conversation and so, People don't understand that there is, there is something afoot here when we're talking about all the other people who've benefited. And I, wa I wanna flesh that out more so others get a chance to hear what that means. So, um, so with that, do you, did you have any thoughts come to mind? Well, certainly on the, on the commercial fishing side, <clears throat> as, a, as one example, is it does go far, you know, far, far and beyond. Um, but let me just let me just say this, and I'll get back to your, your answer your question. You know, I often heard, and I've heard radio talk show hosts that I don't agree with, and I don't know why I was even listening, but maybe they were talking about me. I wanted to hear what they had to say. Um, something to the effect that we can't, we can no longer afford rural Alaska, and I bristle at that because the really the 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 right way to say it is, I'm not sure rural Alaska can afford urban Alaska because our, our revenues and resources uh, come from rural Alaska. They come from the lands uh, they are in rural Alaska, um, or <clears throat> so the vast majority does. So um, it's interesting that we, you know, we, uh, when there's a pushback in, in, from one of the uh, corporations or one of the communities, one of the, you know, villages against certain development, you know, well, they're, they're stopping, they're, by doing that, they're stopping development for Alaska. Well, no, um, you know, we used to have the coastal zone management uh, plan that allowed for input in, in some of that, the, those coastal areas as far as for, uh, before development was, was begun. And so I, I think we sometimes have the, we have the model backwards on the, quite honestly in the way, the way that we function as a, as a state. And so, um, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I did this in a, in a, in a trial one time. So I was suggested it, it, it worked. We won the case. We convinced the judge and, and we had need to help this the gentleman understand what happened. But, you know, we had a, um, we had a tree lit up with lights on a board. 
And as certain things were decisions that were made, if he made, then the, these certain lights would go out. And I, 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 I'm kind of envisioning that on this issue as far as, you know, a, a board lit up with all the things we have in Alaska right now. And then take away certain things that were a direct result of ANCSA uh, and, and see how many of those lights would go out and see what that board would look like once you were done with that. I mean, a visual sometimes is, 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 is better than a spreadsheet. And so um, I, I think that, uh, uh, I think there's something there that, I mean, it, it, it's, I think there's something there and it, it, it would help to help tell the story um, uh, differently. And, and, and I, I do remember well, <clears throat> the, the first, not the first, one of the first AFN conventions I, I went to was in Fairbanks. And I went to one of the breakout sessions on resource, on fishing. And a um, Alaska Native woman with a, a, um, a bit of a squirming three-year-old grandson who stood in line for 45 minutes to speak to the delegation <clears throat> on, on fishing issues. And what she said when she got up to speak, she said it very well. She said, you know, where I am on the Yukon River, if I catch a king salmon for dinner, I go to jail certain times of the year. But in, in Washington, D.C., you can order it on the menu any day you want. She says, there's something, <clears throat> there's something just wrong that, that I can't feed my family uh, when I need to. And so <clears throat> that's a, that's a, those are big issues that, that need to be um, need to be addressed, <clears throat> but if you can address them, you know, you know, not that I'm anti-litigation, I just think it's a painful process and a long process, and there really aren't any real winners necessarily. There's someone, you know, survives for another day and it comes back from, from another direction. So, <clears throat> so I, I think that those issues are uh, part of the, part of the, part of the challenge. Of, of how do we help Alaskans understand the importance of, of that. And, um, and, and it's, it, I don't think you can do it in a classroom. I really don't. Yeah, goodness, cheers. I, uh, I appreciate that. I think that that's, that's what we're struggling with, right? Is to try to figure out how do you actually help people see it when the narrative has been so um, silenced or erased or hidden or <clears throat> one of those maybe not obvious enough kind of um places but uh being able to uh, have a conversation oh go ahead <clears throat> it used to be that in in the high school sports <clears throat> you know you would stay with families and you wouldn't stay in a hotel you wouldn't stay in the gym floor you would go home with families when we did that in valdez we'd go to cordova and, and you'd, you know you'd compete you know Till, till the, the buzzer rings and then you then you go home and you, you establish relationships. I mean, I, I, I Steve Ivanoff in Unalaska, um, you know, we had a basketball tournament in, in uh, Unalaska, I'm, I'm sorry, Unilicleet, Unalaska Unilicleet in 69. And, and um, um, I, I still know, you know, people from that experience. And so I, I think, it, I mean, if I could, <clears throat> wave a magic wand on high school sports is that people stay with families and get to know those people <clears throat> because you establish a lifetime of relationships that way. And so I just am all about, you know, relationships are about how it makes you feel and you remember that feeling. So I, I just think there's, I think there's, there's, um, and you know, it's not sometimes what is said is who says it. Mm -hmm. That somebody that uh, you know, a governor can say can you know make speeches all the live long day, you know. But then, then you hear some of the speeches that are made at AFN. Uh, they're just amazing uh, because you remember that feeling when you hear um, a young person uh, tell their story, and some are some are good stories and some are very painful stories. But so it's you know I anyway. I, I don't mean to over oversell the relationship uh, piece of it, but I, I, it's what worked for me, and and obviously it's a friend as as, as well as far as the relationship she established in uh, uh, in Juno, and and uh, so I just think that's sometimes what's missing is that we're t we're talking past each other rather than to each other. So, yeah, that's for sure. We can't hear each other. 
Yeah, exactly. And we don't create spaces for us to hear each other. So it compounds that. Um, mm -hmm. It compounds the lack of um, relationship building, which stops our ability to really hear each other and, and understand not just our lived experiences, but our knowledges and those lived knowledges. And so I just want to say how much I appreciate being able to spend time with both of you tonight and try to peel this onion. <laughs> I do feel like it is an onion um, because it does, uh, it can be very frustrating as a native person. It can be very frustrating and hurtful and painful. Um, and like you, you know, were mentioning earlier, Bill, that, you know, there are some sentiments that are wrongful sentiments about native people um, and our rural communities or villages. And that can be really painful, but if you take the time to understand and um, cook it up a little bit, it actually gets <laughs> <laughs> It always turns back to food at some point. Uh, but as we're closing out our time together, I wanted to just um, open it up uh, to see if you had any final kind of insights or ahas um, from our discussion tonight that you wanna share about the, the others that benefited from, from ANCSA? Well, I think both Bill and I have said all Alaskans have. So it's a matter of how do you say that in a way that people can relate to? And some of it's by examples. You talk about a specific case. Some of it's about people. You talk about a specific person. And some of it is about getting people to be willing to open their minds to seeing things in a different way. And that's all possible, but it is not quick. And it isn't just one night's conversation. It's not just one report. It's not just one relationship, right? It's kind of a journey. And so I think this, just like a number of other conversations about the significance of ANCSA, perhaps it helps spread and gives people something more tangible to hold on to. Sometimes numbers do that, sometimes only seeing. I mean, look around Anchorage and look at how many buildings are either regional corporations or village corporation buildings. I mean, for some people, maybe it's just taking a drive around Anchorage and realizing how much real estate, how many buildings have been built, how many construction industry jobs, you know, for some people it's visual. It isn't just numbers. And, you know, so I don't think there's one answer to your questions that you've asked about how to uh, peel uh, onion. I think it takes a lot of different approaches and a lot of different times and some patience and, you know, I'm, again, just like Bill, grateful to have the opportunity to chat with you about this and, and continue our mutual joint journey in this space. So with that, I'll say good night. <clears throat> well, I, um, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be part of this, of this discussion. And, and it really has been an honor. And, um, and you know, it's something that um, it won't be change overnight, obviously, uh, on, on, a, on a single uh, idea or suggestion, but it's a, it's a journey. And it's a journey for helping uh, all Alaskans understand um, how the, our, the history, you know, I mean, I, I always felt a little almost embarrassed when I was introduced or an issue was made, the fact that I was an Alaskan born, Alaskan born governor. I'm I'm such a newbie to Alaska in comparison, of, and I, as I would do that next, staying next to Byron Malott, you know, or Val Davidson. I mean, I mean, it just it just felt I was always just a little bit uncomfortable with that, just because, you know, I, I'm 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 such a new kid on the block uh, in comparison, and so I think when people realize that, and and so, and sometimes you know, issues are made about how long somebody's been in Alaska. Well, if we're going to do that. Then, then we, I lose every time, and 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 uh, and I recognize that, and and so that's really was part of my my journey was realizing the, you know, the 
generations of generations and generations. And, you know, one of the things that I hope can be passed on to those that haven't seen it is the way that the elders are honored. It is, I think, I think it's unique and it's something we can, we can learn from. You know, I remember when COVID <clears throat> began driving to Valdez and, and just after, you know, in, in one of the, one of the communities there, um, there was a sign that said, you can't come in because they're protecting their elders. And I, I thought that was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And so I think the tribal health system is a phenomenal health a success story. And, and we can learn from that and more that we can do with compacting and learn from the successes. We sometimes, you know, fight about the, the, the challenges and we step over the successes. And, and so I, I just think there's, there's so much to be learned um, by working together and having more of these kinds of sessions and doing more of what, you know, first of all, ask us what you do. Yeah. Thank you both for, for sharing. I, I appreciate the opportunity, Bill, that you and I got to work together when you were the governor and Fran. I'm sorry I didn't get that opportunity, but it's nice to spend the evening with you this evening. And, and I appreciate that the two of you shed some light on, on topics and specific examples that maybe some of our people in Alaska didn't know about. Um, I'm not an original shareholder, even though I am of age. <laughs> Log and I and I are both Anxa babies, so um, it's quite fitting that we get to host these coffee times. Um, but even though I'm not an original shareholder, it, it, it always hurts and is frustrating to hear so many people who just don't understand our corporations beat them up and our tribes. You know, they, they get, there's a lot of critics out there. And so I appreciate the support that the two of you have shown the Alaska Native community over the years. And you, and, and you put your work and your, your professional lives and your passion towards helping our people. And so I just wanna say koyana, shinak, bonashchish, hawa for um, this evening and all that you've done. Bonashchish yeah, as well from myself. And, you know, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's the, the, the opportunity to spend time together, even though we can't uh, be housed, we called it being housed out, right? <laughs> travel to other people and stay in other people's homes. It's kind of, you know, our little virtual version of that here because we're all so intimately in each other's yeah. homes mm -hmm. in sessions. Um, and being able to just have a, informal conversation like this means so much because in other in other situations and forums there's so much um structure and formality that it doesn't give us a chance to just kind of relax into a conversation and have a talk so i want to thank you both for being willing to do that with us tonight and um to start having the conversation and and should you wake up in the middle of the night or in the morning and you think oh I should have I should have shared this as an example or a story. Please email me um, because we are trying to track and be able to kind of pull this pull this out and make the story more visible for everyone. So I just offer that invitation um, as I share appreciation for both of you for saying yes and for spending some good time with us during this Anxiety Coffee time. And I know it's late in the time zones you are both in and um, look forward to seeing you guys in person once this pandemic stuff gets cleared up. And, um, and we'll sign off for the evening. So punish chish hawa to both of you. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Take care, best to your families. Take care. Thank you very much.